Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. It's, uh, I'm delighted to be here today. I'm going to give uh, uh, a bit of an overview, which is different, I think, from the two speeches you've heard, uh, not necessarily a historical perspective, but more where are we at today in terms of women in business and, and women in the economy. Uh, and for those who don't know, Women in Capital Markets uh, is an organization we've been around for 23 years, actually, uh, focused on um, advancing women not only in the capital markets industry, but in uh, women in leadership in the Canadian economy more broadly. So that's sort of what we're thinking about every day uh, in this organization. So I'm going to talk a bit first about um, leadership in the economy. Uh, this slide here looks at uh, boardroom representation uh, in some different countries around the world and, and shows where Canada ranks here. And clearly it's, it's a sad graph for Canada here, unfortunately. I have a bit of bad news in, in my overview here. Um, we sit at 12% in terms of our publicly traded non-venture um, uh, companies in terms of our representation of women. Uh, and clearly you can see that a lot of other countries are looking a lot better on that front. And Countries on the left-hand side of the graph here, uh, many of those have implemented quotas. Uh, but you've also had countries like uh, the UK and Australia uh, where there hasn't been quotas, but over the last few years through um, comply or explain regulation, which is really just transparency, and I'll talk a bit about that, uh, have managed to drive um, attention to this issue and really drive up the numbers of women on boards in, in those countries. So just to give you an example, the UK was at 12.5% um, in 2012 and now is up at 26%. So there has been a big focus there. So in Canada, um, we haven't seen as much of that focus until recently. And, and the reason we're seeing this globally is not a social justice issue. Um, these countries have begun to pay attention to this because of the business case uh, around gender diversity. Uh, and, and I'll talk a bit about the research that, that exists this today. Um, so much, much research has been done on this topic, uh, and it all falls, you know, it's generally called the business case. And so companies like Credit Suisse, like Catalyst, uh, like McKinsey have done research around looking at companies that have higher gender diversity on their boards or in the executive suite, and uh, that correlation with performance. And there is that correlation exists, and it's been proven over and over. There's a very large body of research on that front. So in McKinsey's case, uh, they found that those companies that had higher gender diversity and leadership outperformed by 15%. Catalyst looked at ROE, those companies with higher, you know, the top quartile companies in terms of gender diversity, they outperformed by 53%. So, you know, I could go on and on and on and give you all kinds of stats, but I won't. Um, there's tons of research, and, and I certainly can provide that to people. But that is the, that's the reason uh, that this attention is, has come to the forefront in many of these countries, and now in Canada. And, and that, you know, there's a correlation, and people oft, often say, well, the research just shows correlation. It doesn't show causality, and so should we really act based on that? Uh, I would make the argument that portfolio managers make decisions on correlation every single day. And, and so there is a vast reason, a very important reason for us to be thinking about why does that correlation exist. And, and there's been other studies that have been done around, so what is going on? What is that dynamic that is creating that outperformance uh, when you have more women in, in leadership and business? And so much of the research focuses on just general governance dynamics. Um, if you bring different types of people to the table, and this doesn't just hold true for gender, obviously, it holds true for ethnicity, culture, um, just different, uh, different ideas and different backgrounds generally, you get better governance, you get better outcomes, uh, you get different ideas, you get more questioning, you get more debate. There's also research around uh, risk aversion. On average, women tend to be uh, more uh, risk averse than men. And so bringing that mix together, not to say that risk aversion is always good, it's just the point is a mix of that is a better thing and you get a better outcome in terms of business decisions. Um, companies that have higher um, uh, or more women on their boards and in executive teams, they tend to have lower gearing, so lower debt overall, and that is correlated over a longer period of time with higher performance, having that lower debt uh, on average. So, so those are the types of things that people are focused on, on when they think about what does that diversity get you in, in the boardroom um, and, and why should we think about this. And the other thing I would mention as well is it's talent pool. I mean, that's a simple argument. Obviously, if you think about the university graduates in, well, globally, uh, women represent 54% of university graduates today. Uh, Canada, today, 62%. Uh, so if you're not including that particular talent pool uh, for leadership in the economy, um, you're really missing the boat. That's, that's a huge talent pool, and it's only growing. The numbers of female uh, graduates, tertiary graduates, is actually increasing year after year, um, which clearly indicates another problem. We do need more young men going to university as well. Um, but that's the reality. That's what the talent pool looks like today. So... 
In Canada, what we saw happen is something similar to um, the UK and Australia, comply or explain regime. So all that is is transparency. So the regulator said, um, and it was Ontario that started this, uh, what we want to see in your disclosure for publicly listed companies is we want to understand how many women you have in senior leadership and on the board. Uh, we want to know if you have a policy around gender diversity. Uh, you know, what are you doing to try to increase the numbers of women in leadership? And uh, we want to know about your renewal mechanisms do you, for your board. Um, do you have any? Uh, and, and then finally, um, do you have targets uh, around this issue and, and how are you performing relative to your targets? And that's exactly what we saw in, in the UK as well, that type of disclosure. Um, so unfortunately, we're in year three. Uh, these are the results for last year, so year two of the Comply or Explain um, disclosure. So 45% of boards have no women on them uh, in, in Canada. And the reason that those companies would give is that they only appoint based on merit. So that implies that they could not find one woman, 45% of these boards, to, who merited a board seat. So clearly that's just ridiculous. Um, nobody actually looked. Um, these, you know, we all know how these things happen, right? People get appoint people they know well, they've worked with before, or who are on other boards, and therefore you don't get that fresh pool coming in. You're getting the same people and the same types of people who have the same networks. Um, it holds true as well, unfortunately, for executive positions. So 41% um, of executive positions, uh, or sorry, there are 41% have no uh, females in their executive roles uh, in, in these publicly listed companies. So this is obviously, you know, a huge issue. And, um, you know, we certainly can't point to the fact that, oh, well, there just hasn't been enough university graduate, female university graduates, because women have actually uh, represented over 50% of university graduates for close to 30 years now. Um, so they are certainly of the vintage that could be in the executive suite today. Uh, it's not a matter of, oh, we'll just wait and organically this will change, because it hasn't changed so far. And so that's why there is this big push to say, <clears throat> excuse me, what is going on and, and how can we really push companies to make progress in this issue? So, Last year, I'll just go to one stat on this particular page here, because we've covered most of them. Um, since we put in place, this was the second year of the Complier Explain disclosure, 521 board seats came up that year, and only 15% were filled by women. So the conclusion that the regulators and others have come to is that people aren't trying very hard on this front. There is really a real reluctance in business to make progress on this and to change the way that we're doing things. And so. You will see, and I'm sure you know, you've already seen much discussion in the media around this topic. Um, the regulators are doing a, there's a three-year review um, that they decided they would do at the beginning of putting this in place. And so this year is a three-year re review uh, where they'll look at what should we do? If, if nobody's making progress on this, uh, is, should there be other measures that we take? Uh, should we uh, enforce targets? N not quotas, targets. I'm not suggesting we're going to quotas in, in Canada right away. though. You never know if we don't make progress. The dialogue around quotas is actually far more vibrant today than it was three years ago. Uh, three years ago, I would tell you that if you said the word quotas, women and men would look at you and say, no, absolutely not. Uh, today, the dialogue is very different um, because we haven't seen with this. Um, I think people thought that with the Comply or Explain, by putting this on the board agenda, that we would see a real concerted effort to make progress in this issue and, and for um, those in those executive positions and boards to really to, to think hard about this and make some progress. So, so we will see in the fall uh, what's going to happen. The OSC, well, the securities regulators will do a review of this, CSA, and come back with some recommendations on what to do further. I will note, um, in addition to what the regulators have done on this front, there is uh, Bill C-25. Uh, it has, was put forward by the um, federal government, uh, by the Minister of Innovation uh, and Economic Development, and it mimics essentially the Comply or Explain regulations for federally incorporated companies. So the government is stepping up as well and uh, has been certainly coming to people like myself and others to say, what should we be doing? What is the next step for us to really make progress on this? Because they know, you know we all know, on the first graph, we lag globally. And for you know, a country that talks so much about diversity and how we embrace diversity, um, this is just unacceptable for us. And I think you know, culturally, a lot of people aren't sort of aware of this. We haven't sort of uh, understood that we are lagging and falling behind on, on this particular issue. So, so often, you know, if we think about this pipeline, often people, when we talk about the issue of women in leadership in business, um, I often hear, well, all the women are obviously, obviously at home and having children. And that's why we can't get them into the executive suite. Um, and that's just you know, a myth that we have to break down. We have to just you know, stop that because it's a red herring. Uh, women are working in Canada. Uh, if you look at these statistics here, we're, we're half the workforce. Um, we're closer actually to 40% of management occupation, occupations. But it's after that 
where we encounter that problem. That's the problem in Canada is why are these women not moving up into these senior leadership roles and what is going on in, in corporations which is stopping that uh, from happening. And, and if we just say it's all about the babies, we're never really going to get there on this issue because it really isn't all about the babies. There's all kinds of other things going on and, and all kinds of research around that. But the, one of, the McKinsey probably is a report I would recommend to people in, in, on this particular issue. There is a summary version, too, if you just want to have the Coles notes. They, they did a study specifically on Canada and on the gender equ uh, inequality in terms of uh, the economy. And um, what they found is if we did, were able to close the um, gender inequality in the economy, that would produce $150 billion in GDP by 2026. Um, so where would that come from? That, that $150 billion in GDP, because that's something we need to think pretty hard about in a lower growth uh, economy. Uh, it would come, 42% of that would come from, number one, getting more women into higher productivity jobs, higher paying jobs, so STEM jobs, engineering, technology, these types of jobs. Another 42% is around uh, labor participation rates. Uh, we used to be actually amongst the highest with Scandinavian countries in terms of labor participation rates. It's gone down uh, over the last few years. So in that study, uh, McKinsey identifies that we actually have over the last uh, 20 years not progressed. We were ranked very high 20 years ago in terms of how gender equality in the economy, and we've actually gone down in the rankings. There was actually a study by the um, uh, EY and the Peterson Institute for uh, International Economics that looked at 92 countries around the world in terms of gender equality in the economy and specifically in corporate leadership and Canada ranked in the bottom 10 in that particular study. So we need to be thinking about this as economy. Uh, it really is, it's a huge, can be a huge driver of growth if we are looking at that half of our population and really making sure that it's becoming a productive element in our economy. So that's why the government's focused on it. That's why the regulators are focused on it right now. Um, we need to think about this issue in the middle here. That's the key. And that's one that I talk to corporations about every day. Um, in the McKinsey study, again, they looked at the likelihood of women and men getting promoted dif at different levels. So from entry level to manager, women are 30% less likely to get promoted to manager. If you go from director to VP, women are 60% less, less likely to be promoted. Um, so why is that? What's going on? Did they all leave and go home and have babies? No. Nope. In fact, the attrition of women was lower in, the, in that study than men. So they were staying at those companies. They were continuing to work. So there is something going on. Um, you know, I like to think it's not a conscious conspiracy or anything. I think we need to think about what unconsciously perhaps is going on uh, in, in, uh, in the corporation and sort of in the meritocracy. Because we all think about, you know, in the business world, it's a meritocracy, right? That's the whole foundation of how we think we run everything every day and, and how rewards are given out and promotions are given out. But there is a large body of research around this. And large corporations in particular financial institutions are doing a lot of work around unconscious bias. And how is that impacting the meritocracy in the corporate world? Um, and certainly in the big banks today, all senior leaders and, and even rippling down through the organizations are getting training on this. So how does it impact uh, hiring, for instance? I mean, same like same. And, and that's, you know, we all tend to gravitate to people who are just like ourselves. That's for women, for men, different ethnicities. That's just the way we function as human beings. And we have to call that out and recognize that when we're hiring people. I mean, I know I will make a judgment within 60 seconds of starting an interview, and then usually what one seeks to do is then confirm exactly what you thought in the first 60 seconds, right? As opposed to challenging yourself to maybe ask different questions. And that's just human nature, so we need to be thinking about that. We need to have diversity at the table, interviewing obviously, so that you're getting different perspectives on the candidates in front of you. Uh, and that holds true throughout the entire cycle. So when I was talking about why are women less likely to get promoted in, in the corporate world and climb that corporate ladder, you need to think about what happens in the corporate world. So what happens is you go in and, you know, generally you get given different projects. You get to work with different people. Um, usually um, you'll get, you know, if you're lucky, you get someone who is really willing to mentor you and champion you. And so if you're one of those lucky people uh, who gets championed and mentored by someone, you get the great work, you get the exposure to senior management, you get to go to all the great, you know, meetings, and then come promotion time. Time, you are more qualified. Well, how do you get that sort of sponsorship? The question around that is generally we pick people like ourselves yet again to sponsor and to champion because we're comfortable. It's predictable. It's lower risk. Uh, so we really have to challenge the whole 
talent development process around that and make sure that everybody is getting a fair experience. And that holds true again uh, for uh, not just gender, but for um, ethnic and cultural diversity as well. It's the same dynamic that's happening there. And as we all know, Canada has this vast pool of diverse talent. And we need to make sure not, not only that we're getting gender uh, and making sure that we're capitalizing that talent, but really capitalizing just generally on, on diversity in our economy. So these are the types of things that uh, are taking place in the more progressive organizations right now to challenge that, that issue around how are we going to get more women into the leadership and keep them in the pipeline for those senior leadership roles. When you think about um, sort of what you know, the government's thinking about and the regulators are thinking about, you know, how do we finally push through this and make progress and make sure that you know, not 150 years from now, but hopefully 10 years from now when, when my girls are going into the corporate world, that this is an issue for the history books and it isn't one that they're still dealing with. And, and so to do that, I do think we need to have a real push. We have the research today. We know why we should do this. That, that exists. Right now it's just execution. And so to get that execution to happen, you really do need uh, a big push uh, around transparency and putting pressure on people to put the statistics out there because, number one, they need to look at it internally and constantly be tracking, am I making progress and what really is happening here around talent development. Um, but we need to see it, uh, you know, if, if it's in the public and if there's pressure on people and, and it's out there, that should help people to put this on the, on the agenda. So Comply or Explain clearly uh, will, is doing that and, and will do that, but it does need a real push from the broader public and from the government because, as you've seen, the numbers really aren't moving you know, despite this particular regulation. So, you know, I do think we'll see some other regulation that will come in, and, and I think hopefully with that and, and a more concerted effort uh, from the corporate community, we can see some progress sooner rather than later. Um, I mentioned the STEM as well. That is a big issue within our educational system. We need to be pushing, this is just not just for women, for everybody. We need to make sure that people are going to school for things they're actually going to get jobs in and where we have a need in the economy, and pushing more women and young women into STEM jobs is also a key issue in terms of closing that gender gap in, in the business world and in our economy. Um, I haven't talked about, I did you know, mention briefly around child, just that this isn't about babies. We do need to have progressive child care policies, obviously, um, but parental leave. Um, we need in this country to not just have leaves for dads, but for dads to actually take the leave and not face a stigma. Uh, around and the same stigma that women face that you know you couldn't possibly take a leave and actually care about your career and and you get taken off of that leadership track so that is the issue when I think about the issues around parenting um, that's the key one is is um, really getting rid of that stigma in the corporate world in the business world around if you have children uh, you couldn't possibly be focused enough on your career uh, or that there has to be one parent that has to stay at home it just has to be you know viewed as part of everybody's life that's part of what we do as a society uh, and so the corporate world needs to reflect that as well. And I think it's really fallen behind um, the rest of society and where our views are at. And, and that's a, an issue that we do need to fix. So, so that is the state. I, I hate to be sort of the bad news person up here uh, around where we stand, but uh, I think, you know, I am a proud Canadian and I want us to do better on this front. And that's why, you know, I've done the work that I've done with women in capital markets. We really, um, we have a vast pool of talent we're not using. I think it absolutely will impact our, our economy for the better if we get corporations and business to focus on this issue. So thank you for having me here today. Appreciate it.